Hi everyone, my name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I'm here today to continue reading The Year of the Rat by Grace Lynn. This book is published by Little Brown and Company, and we're gonna pick up where we left off with chapter 15, Fresh Off the Boat, where Pacey is dealing with a new student at her school, Dunway, who is a student that came from China. Dunway, Rich, and Kurt were punished for fighting by getting an in-school suspension. That means they still had to come to school, but they had to do all their work in a separate room away from their classes. They weren't allowed to see anyone, and no one was allowed to see them. But everyone talked about them. Becky and Charlotte talked about Kurt and Rich the most. I know they would like it if Rich and Kurt liked them, and I kind of understood why. Rich was cute, and and if he liked you and was nice to you, that would mean you were special because you would be the only one that he was nice to. Somehow, him being mean to everyone else except for you would make you special. But even though that made sense, it still seemed backwards to me. Sometimes I felt like my head hurt from trying to figure it out. The whole thing made me feel strange. I just wanted to forget about it. But the next day at dinner, I knew that that wouldn't be possible. Pacey, Mom said, why didn't you tell me there was a new Chinese boy in school? I shrugged. The school called me up today and asked me to talk to him and his family since they just came from China and Dad and I speak Chinese, Mom said. His family invited us to come over for dinner. Pacey, I want you to be friends with him. I looked up, alarmed. Do I have to? Why not, Mom said. I don't know, I mumbled, looking down at my plate. He's kind of weird. Weird how, Mom pushed. I didn't know what to say. I looked at the grains of rice sticking to the ends of my chopsticks in mushy clumps. If I squinted my eyes, I could pretend that they were mashed potatoes. Aw, Lissy said, breaking in. Don't make Pacey be friends with him. It's hard enough fitting in without being friends with someone fresh off the boat. What does that mean, fresh off the boat, Kiki asked. You know fresh off the boat, Lissy said. That's what they call people who just came here from another country and don't know how to be American yet. It doesn't sound like you call them that in a nice way, Mom said. It seems like people say that in a mean way. I guess so, Lissy said, considering, because they're the ones everyone thinks are nerds and looks down on. Well, that's wrong, Mom said sharply. They all looked up surprised. Mom really rarely spoke like that. She looked at us seriously. It's very hard to come to a new country, and it's even harder when others judge you harshly. You feel ashamed in a way that you never can forget. I know I'll never forget my mistake with canned meat. Even though Dad and I had studied English for six years in Taiwan, when we came to the United States, as is, it was as if we knew nothing. Every day in my college class, I was so confused. I could never understand what the professor was saying. His words seemed to fly by me like sparrows, and if I could catch one or two, it was like grabbing feathers in the wind. Here's a picture of Pacey's mom in her college class. I was desperate to do better, so I decided that I would pack myself two meals and spend the whole day in the library studying. But even the simplest things, like making myself food, were hard. Buying food in Taiwan was different than in the United States. Our supermarket in Taiwan was a building with hundreds of vendors with their own stands inside, each one calling out for people to buy their goods. It was always full of people crowded together, like the pearls and tapioca pudding. There was always someone smiling and talking, trying to show you the best fruit or the best deal. In America, the grocery store was big and cold and empty, with aisles full of food that seemed to go on like a maze. And I didn't know what to buy. Everything was packaged differently. And I had a hard time reading, uh, I had a hard time reading the words. I needed to buy something that would be easy to bring with me and also inexpensive because Dad and I didn't have that much money. I finally stopped in an aisle where there were all kinds of canned meat and fish. It was so cheap. In Taiwan, canned fish was a treat, an expensive delicacy. I was eager to try this American kind, but there were so many brands. Finally, I chose the brand with the tiger on it. In Taiwan, there was a Lucky Tiger brand of meat, and I thought maybe this was the American version. So the next day, I got up very early and went to the library to study. There were some students in my class sitting at the table across from me, but they didn't talk to me. So I took it out, I took out my canned meat and opened it at lunchtime and tried some with my chopsticks. Yuck, no wonder it was so cheap, it tasted horrible. Then I heard a loud noise of disgust. I looked up and saw one of the girls from my class looking at me like I was a dirty cockroach. 
She closed her book loudly, pulled her friend's sleeve, and turned around to leave, as if she couldn't bear the sight of me. While I couldn't understand the English of my professor's lectures, or the sales clerk in the store, her words were clear in my ear. That's so gross, she said to her friend. Those Chinese will eat anything. I dropped my chopstick and gathered my books and food, rushing home, tears burning in my eyes like boiling oil. When Dad got home, I told him the story and we looked at the canned meat together. And slowly we figured out why my cat classmate was disgusted. The canned meat was cat food. I was so embarrassed and horrified, Mom finished. I'll never forget how ashamed I felt. You really ate cat food, I said. It would have been funny if Mom hadn't felt so bad about it. Yes, Mom said. Things got better after that, but it took a long time. That's why you should be more understanding of people who are fresh off the boat. It's easy to make mistakes, and it's hard to fit in. Mom's story made me feel sad, and I hoped when we went over to Denway's house, they wouldn't serve us cat food for dinner. Chapter 16. Dinner with the Enemy. That weekend, we went over to Denway's house for dinner. I dreaded it. I tried to make excuses for why I couldn't go, but Mom wouldn't listen to me. Even when I said I had too much homework and needed to study, that didn't work. And that almost always worked. Instead, all she did was fuss about us and our manners. When we're having dinner, don't play with your chopsticks, Mom said to us, as she covered a box of chocolates and ladybug red paper. They were the good kind of chocolates, the one with lots of nuts and crunchy toffee, and they came wrapped in gold foil. We were going to give them to Dunway's family. Lucky them. And don't pretend your chopsticks are drumsticks like you do at home. That is bad manners. Okay, okay, we said, bored by her instruction. And only put them on your plate. Don't put the chopsticks on the table, Mom said. And don't stick your chopsticks straight up in your rice bowl either. Yes, Dad said. It's very bad. It reminds people of incense sticks at temples. Is an incense good, Lissy said. Good when you are honoring spirits, Dad said. Not for when you are honoring your stomach. When we got to the house, I felt weird. It was strange going to Melody's house with someone else living there. Everything was the same, but different. It was the same brown, brown house, but Melody's stained glass unicorn wasn't in the window, and her brother's toy trucks weren't on the lawn. Even though a cheerful yellow glow lit from uh, the windows, I felt like the house was abandoned. But the door burst open as soon as we rang the doorbell, and Dunway and his parents welcomed us in. Ni hao, ni hao ma, they said, bowing as we came in. That means, hello, how are you? Dunway bowed to me. He didn't smile, but he didn't act unfriendly either. So I didn't trust it. I gave him a small bow back. You never know what to expect with the enemy. Je vais bay, Lucy said, trying to show off. Dunway and his parents looked puzzled until Dad said something in Chinese. Then they all laughed. What's so funny, Lucy asked. You just got things confused, Mom said. Je vais bay is Taiwanese, not Chinese. The Lou's didn't know what you were saying. Mrs. Lou pushed us towards the dining room, through the kitchen. Everything was different from when Melody lived here. All of Melody's stickers had been scraped off the cabinets, and the dog man magnets we used to play with on the refrigerator were gone. And right near the stove, above the dull metal walk and knife, was a blade sharpened like a brick. A red picture hung. It was hung, a printed picture of a Chinese man from ancient times. Underneath what I thought was a helmet with wings, he had a large white and pinkish purple face. Later, Mom told me that this was a picture of the kitchen god, a Chinese god that watched over the family. I could believe that. I felt like his black eyes were watching me the whole time. I hurried into the living room to get away from them. The dining table was covered with food. There was fried sh shrimp with Salt Lake crystals, dandelion yellow stained chicken stuffed with rice, light brown pork buns, stir-fried vegetables and noodles, a fish with mushrooms and meat, a moon-colored soup, cotton white steamed rice, and corn on the cob. Corn on the cob, I was surprised. I couldn't help giggling a little. It seemed so out of place on the table full of Chinese food. That's funny. I like corn on the cob, Lizzie said quickly. I could tell she was afraid I was being rude. We eat it all the time in the summer. Yes, Mrs. Lu said and nodded at her. In China, too. Really? I said. I thought corn on the cob was American. But we eat it in China too, Mr. Lu told me. People sell it on the street, like hot dogs. Yes, Mom said. They do that in Taiwan too. Really, I said. It seems so strange to think that Chinese and Taiwanese people ate food that I thought was completely American. But I was still glad to eat it. 
and that's what I did all through dinner. The parents talked and laughed in Chinese, so all Lissy, Kiki, and I did was eat, since we didn't understand any of it. Dunway didn't say much. Once or twice, Lissy tried to say something to him, but he just shook his head. He couldn't understand us either. Dunway, Mr. Lu said to him once, try to speak English. Dunway just looked at his plate, and Mr. Lu said something to Mom and Dad in Chinese. They made sympathetic noises, and we knew they were talking about Dunway. He knew so, too, because his scowl was like the black ink of a squid, dark and hostile. For a moment, I was scared. It looked like the enemy was going to attack. This a picture of Dunway scowling. But Mr. Lou said, why don't you kids go to the other room? We rented some movies that you can watch. The blackness on Dunway's face cleared away as we left the table. We went to the living room, which used to be Melody's dad's office. Dunway took out the movies and held them out to me. I chose the one about a superhero. We'd seen it already, but I didn't mind seeing it again. I wondered how Dunway would like it, considering he couldn't understand what they were saying. But he seemed to enjoy it. He laughed at all the funny parts with us. Maybe he knew more English than he let on. Anyway, by the time the superhero had destroyed the evil monster robot, it was time to go home. Dunway got our coats and the Lou family bowed as we thanked them and said goodbye. As we got into the car, I yawned because I was full and tired and ready for bed. Dinner with Dunway and his family hadn't been that bad after all. In fact, for the enemy, they seemed a lot like us. Chapter 17, Birthday. Spring and summer were now blending together. The ground was no longer a mix of seaweed-colored grass and mud that felt like wet tea leaves at the bottom of a cup. The gray rain stopped and white clouds dotted the sky. It was May and that meant my birthday was coming. Mom said that in Taiwan, they didn't have birthday cup parties for kids, only for adults. So I knew I had to pay attention to make sure we did everything right. For my birthday this year, we were going to see a play. The high school drama club was putting on a play called Anne of the Thousand Days, which was about the Queen of England a long time ago. All the girls in my class were going to come over to my house for cake and presents, and then mom was going to drive us to the high school to see the play. I felt like it was the right way to have my party since I was getting too old to have a party where we played games. Even though I knew I could make my own invitations better than the ones that they had at the store, I bought the ones with balloons on them and sent those. Mom tried to help by buying a cookbook that had recipes for cakes and cookies, but I knew it was too risky to have her make something. She never baked American things, just Chinese food like steamed buns and taro tapioca. In fact, the only time Mom used her cake tin is when she made lo bakko, a salty radish cake that you fried. Here's a picture of Mom's radish cake. You fried and ate with soy sauce, and I couldn't have that at my party. So instead we ordered a cake from Hemstraut's Bakery. It had blue flowers and happy birthday grace written in matching icing on the top. I wanted everything to be perfect. And it looked like I was gonna get my wish. Mom got soda, caramel corn, potato chips, and every girl that was invited came, except, of course, Melody. You know how Anne of a Thousand Days is supposed to be a love story about the king and queen of England, Becky asked? Heather Smeal, the girl that plays Anne, and David Williams, the boy who plays King, are boyfriend and girlfriend in real life. Oh, that's so cute, Charlotte said. They're perfect together. They're both blonde and tall. No wonder they got those parts. They're the cutest couple in the high school. Who would you think would be the cutest couple in our grade? One of the girls asked. Well, you and Jerry Lucelli would be cute, Charlotte said. You both have curly brown hair. You and Rich would be really cute, Becky told Charlotte. You both have the cutest smiles. All the girls started giggling and we began pairing up everyone in our grade. I thought it was fun until I heard Charlotte say that she thought Alice would be a cute couple with Sam Mercer. I liked Sam. I wanted him to be a cute couple with me. Who do you think that I would be a cute couple with? I asked. Hmm, I don't know, Charlotte said. Maybe dumb way? Dumb way? Charlotte, don't say that, Becky said. That's not nice. Who would want to be a couple with dumb way? No, I was only saying that because you're both Chinese, Charlotte protested. It's hard to match you in a cute couple. You don't fit anyone else. Suddenly, I felt like a flower wilting. Was it true? Was the only boy I'd ever be a cute couple with, Dunway? Would no one ever else ever like me because I was Chinese? And I wasn't even really Chinese either. It wasn't fair. I felt angry. Angry at Charlotte for saying it, angry at Dunway for being fresh off the boat, and angry at myself because I was Taiwanese. Suddenly, 
I didn't want to party anymore. I just wanted everyone to go away. Happy birthday, Mom sang as she came through the door with my cake. It was all lit up and everyone joined the song. Even though everyone was smiling and laughing, I felt like crying. When it was time for me to make my wish, a hundred wishes filled my head and mixed into one. I wished for the party to be over, for Dunway to have not come to my school, for Melody to not have moved, and for me to not be Chinese or Taiwanese. But most of all, I wish the year of the rat with its changes had never come. Chapter 18, Library Book. After my birthday, I started using my library option again. Library was option was when you chose to read in the library instead of going out to the playground. I had used it all the time with Melody, but since she laughed, I had gone out in the playground to be with Charlotte and Becky. Now I felt like not going on a playground was a good way to avoid Dunway, as well as the uncomfortable feeling I had with Becky and Charlotte. Whenever I was with them, I always felt like a shoe on the wrong foot, somehow not fitting. It was strange because I never felt like that with them before Melody had come and gone. Before, nothing they talked about really ever bothered me. And we all used to laugh together. But now sometimes, especially when they talked about Kurt and Rich, they annoyed me, like mosquito bites on my back that I couldn't reach. I loved using my library card. Um, library, so the library option was a relief. Besides, I loved reading. Our class had a reading contest called Shoot for the Moon. There was a big bulletin cut board cut out with everyone's name on one side and a moon on the other side. For every book you finished, Miss McGon put a star with the book's title and your book's summary next to your name. The goal was to get so many stars lined up to your, next to your name that it reached the moon. Everyone who reached the moon got a prize. Before, Melody and I had wanted to reach the moon together and we would wait for each other before we put a star up. But since she wasn't here, I just read as fast as I could, so my line of stars grew and grew. It made me a little sad to see my name stretch out past Melody's. I guessed Melody would never reach the moon. There's a picture of the moon and you can see Grace's line of stars is the one that goes the furthest. The book I was reading now was Harriet the Spy. It was a good book. Harriet wanted to be an author like me. She wrote everything down in a notebook. I thought that was a good idea. Maybe I'd get mom to buy me a notebook so I could do the same. When the bell rang at the end of recess, I didn't want to put the book away. How was it going to end? I decided to borrow it and take it home to finish. I couldn't wait to finish it. I read it in the car while we took Kiki to her violin recital in the dressing room when Lissy was trying on her new jeans and finally finished it on the way to the post office when I mailed the cheerleader book back to Melody. I really liked it even though I thought Harriet was careless to lose her notebook. I wouldn't have lost mine. But on Monday morning before school, I couldn't find the book. Where had I put it? I checked everywhere, under the bed, on the sofa, in the kitchen. It wasn't in any of those places. Where was it? A day passed, then a week, then another, and still I couldn't find it. And then one day, Mrs. McGon handed me a pink slip of paper. It was an overdue notice. It said Harriet the spy had to be returned immediately. What was I gonna do? I was so worried I stopped using my library option because I was afraid our librarian, Mrs. McCurdy, would ask me about the book. When I showed mom my overdue notice, she shook her head. I told you I wouldn't clean your room anymore, she said. You're old enough to take care of yourself. I'm sure it's somewhere in there. It's a mess. I didn't think my room was a mess. I thought it was cozy, just like a mouse's nest or a squirrel's hole before winter. But maybe mom was right and it was in there somewhere. I spent the whole night cleaning and organizing. By the time I was done, I had found a box of pink, green, and blue colored erasers that smelled like candy, my glitter unicorn stickers, my silver star bicycle belt, and my socks with the dogs on them, but no book. After I got my second overdue notice, mom said that she would look for me. So all day when I was in school, mom cleaned and searched the house. No luck. You probably dropped it somewhere, mom said. The only thing that you can do is tell the library that you lost it. I didn't want to do that. What if Mrs. McCurdy yelled at me? Would it Miss McGunn take down my stars saying that I didn't deserve to reach the moon because I'd lost a book? I probably would never be allowed to take a book out of the library again. But I had to. The next morning, I received my third overdue notice. It said, please see Mrs. McCurdy immediately and red ink in the bottom. I gulped. At the library, Mrs. McCurdy looked at me from behind her glasses. Grace, she said crisply. 
Harry the Spy is over a month overdue. Holly H Honchel in Mrs. Robertson's class have been waiting for it. Um, I stammered. Uh, I lost the book. Oh dear, Mrs. McCurdy said. Are you sure? I nodded. Well, she said, I'm afraid you'll have to pay the library to get a new one. How much will it cost? I asked. Hmm. Miss McCarty started to type some letters onto the computer. Ten dollars and eighty-five cents. Ten eighty-five? That was a lot of money. Two years ago, I won fourth place in a book contest and won four hundred dollars. I guessed it would have, I would have to take the money from that. When I got home, Mom counted my money for me. I only had eleven dollars and forty cents left for my prize. I used to be rich, I said. What happened? You spent it, Mom said, remember? You bought a new bike. You and Melody went to the state fair, the bookstore, the art store. It all adds up. I guess it did. The next day I paid for my book, and during library option, instead of reading, I figured out how much money I had left. I had only 55 cents. That wasn't a lot of money at all. I wasn't rich anymore. Now I was poor. A sad feeling came over me, like gray rain on my birthday. I was so unlucky. When I got home, there was a package waiting for me. It was from Melody. That made me feel better. I opened it up and there was my lost library book. I couldn't believe it. That's where the book had been the whole time. I must have mailed it to her by mistake when I sent her the cheerleader's book and she had read it too. I wonder if Miss McGunn would add a new star next to Melody's name. And then there's a letter from Melody. It says, Dear Pacey, I got the cheerleader's books. Thanks. After I'm done reading them again, I'll send them back. I also read Harriet the Spy. You sent it me, to me with the cheerleader's books. It was a good book. I thought it was too bad that she lost her notebook and all her friends got mad at her, though. Anyway, when I got to the end, I saw the library sticker, and I think that you sent me the book by mistake. So I'm sending it back before I send the cheerleader's books. I hope you don't get in trouble for sending me the book. It's hot here in California. You're having a water shortage, which means that I can't take long showers. I will tell you about it later. How's Sam Mercer? Your friend, Melody. Chapter 19, Bad Grade. Even though I had found my library book, I still felt like my tiger luck had left me because when Miss McGon handed Charlotte, Becky, and me our grades on the Viking Project, we got a C plus. That was the lowest grade I ever got. What would mom and dad say? Miss McGon wrote on our paper, the candy boat was very cute, but it didn't show me what you knew about the Vikings. Also, it didn't look like there was enough work done for a three person project. Are your parents going to get mad at you for not getting an A, Charlotte said when she saw my face. You always get A. They shouldn't get ma mad because you got a bad grade once. That was true. And the more that I thought about it, the more that I began to think that Charlotte was right. Mom and Dad were too picky. One bad grade was not a big deal. Unfortunately, Mom didn't think that way at all. When I told her about my grade, because Dad wasn't home yet, she looked at me very seriously. I knew I was in trouble. You got a C, Mom said? That's not very good. What happened? I don't know, I said defensively. Miss McGunn just gave me one. There must be a reason, Mom said. You should have done much better. I don't know why you think it's such a big deal, I burst out. Everyone gets bad grades in my class. I don't always have to get A's. It's not about the grade, Mom said. Tell the truth. Did you do the best that you could on the project? I wanted to say yes, but I thought about all the times I went over to Becky's house. We were supposed to be working on the project, but most of the time they just talked about Kurt and Rich while I ate candy. We didn't really work that hard on the project at all. I don't care about the grade, Mom said, if you worked your hardest and put your effort into it. You do too care about the grade, I argued. What if I didn't work at all and got an A? You wouldn't say anything then. Pacey, Mom said, you're not looking at this the right way. I do want you to get good grades in school and do well in school, but not for me, for you. I want you to grow up and be able to do whatever you want. Getting good grades and learning things is the key to any door you want to open in your future. If you don't try your best, you're hurting yourself the most. This made me think. Mom talking about doors reminded me about how being an author and an illustrator was a cold door. Was getting good grades the key to opening it? Even though I wasn't sure if I wanted to go through the cold door, I still wanted to be able to open it. I could always change my mind after the door was open. But if it was locked, I wouldn't even get the choice. Still, I didn't want to admit that mom was right. Well, trying my best all the time is hard, I said. And if it's for me, and then I don't mind getting a bad grade once in a while. 
Well, then I mind for you, Mom said, which is why I care about your grades. Maybe I care more about you than you care about yourself. And strangely, even though Mom said that in an angry voice, it made me feel kind of happy inside. Suddenly I realized that even if I was unlucky and my tiger luck left me, my mom never would. And that would never change. Am I going to be punished? I asked. Mom gave me a funny smile and sighed. She sat down next to me. Did I ever tell you about when I was punished for my bad grades? Mom asked. When I was your age, I was punished for my grades all the time. Not by my parents, but by my teachers. Remember when I told you that schools in Taiwan were different from schools here? Well, they were very different in some ways that were not nice. One of my teachers was especially strict and ruthless. Everything about her was mean. She looked like a witch and when she smiled, it was like a dog baring its teeth to attack. Every morning after test days, the teacher would call us up one by one and beat our hands with a stick. The number of questions we got wrong on the test were the number of times she'd beat us. One of my friends, Jan, lived in special fear of our teacher. Jan tried very hard, but whenever our test came, she could not pass. Every day I studied with her for hours trying to help her. I wish I were smart like you, she would say to me. I would do anything to be smarter. And she did try everything. She would sleep with her books and rewrite math problems over and over again, but it didn't seem to help. One day, the teacher surprised us by handing our teeth, our, our test back to us without a beating. Jan and I looked at each other, hopeful that perhaps we would escape punishment, but we should have known better. Everyone who didn't have a perfect score, stand up, she barked after everyone received their paper. I want to, you to slap your face and keep slapping. We did as we were told. Harder ye, she ordered out to a student who wasn't hitting herself with enough strength. Faster, Geely, she yelled at another. Only when our faces were as pink as leashy skin did she nod, grim and satisfied. Okay, she said, those with only one wrong answer can stop and sit down. And then she would wait another two minutes and let those with only two wrong answers sit down. And then after that, those with three wrong answers could sit down and so on. When I was lucky enough to sit down, I watched in horror as Yan stood for what seemed like hours beating herself. Her face throbbed blood red from soreness and embarrassment as she was singled out as the stupidest in class. Yan's eyes shone with tears like a helpless dog about to be run over by a train. But when she looked at me, it wasn't a look for help. It was a look of yearning. I knew she wished that she could be like me, smart enough to remember the answers after studying, smart enough to answer questions correctly, smart enough to sit down. Even today, I can remember poor Yan's red face with her pathetic eyes burning. When I was promoted to the next grade with a different teacher, sometimes I would be tempted to not study as hard. But I would remember Jan and how hard she studied and how much she envied me and I would feel ashamed. That's why it's very important that you always try your best, Mom said. Jan tried so hard but couldn't pass the test. She would have done anything to be able to get a good grade. For you to not get a good grade because you are lazy is shameful. And that, if anything, is what deserves punishment. That's horrible, I said. The police should have arrested that teacher. Things were different back then, Mom said. They're better now, but the same idea that you should work hard is still the same. I guess that thing, since things were different, not all the changes were that bad. I was glad that Ms. McGon wasn't anything like Mom's old teacher. So will you promise to work harder, Mom said, and no more bad grades because of laziness? I agreed. Chapter 20. Clifford's American Wedding. The leaves and lawns sparkled green like emerald jewels, and our yellow school bus that dropped us off for the last time that year looked like a sunflower on the streets. School was finally over, summer was here, and that meant that we were going to Clifford's wedding. He was going to get married in Boston, Massachusetts, where his other grandparents lived. Our grandparents lived in Taiwan, but it was the other side of the family. I had never been to Boston before. Everyone said it was a good place to eat beans. I didn't know why, but even though I didn't like beans, I couldn't wait to go. Kiki was gonna be a flower girl. I was jealous. Mom bought her a special white dress with lace that fluffed out and she was going to carry a basket of flowers. It was almost as good as being a bride. The night before the wedding, we stayed at a hotel near Clifford's grandparents' house. It was fun staying at the hotel. The only bad thing about it was that I had to share a bed with Lissy. She kicked. In the morning, Mom rushed us to get ready for the wedding. We had to be there early since Kiki was the flower girl. Kiki got to wear her new flower girl dress where Lissy and I had to wear our Chinese silk dresses with the tight collars. Lissy had grown so much that Mom brought her a new dress, too. It was a deep sapphire blue and embroidered with silver gold bamboo leaves. 
I didn't like my dress. It was bright green, the color of steamed broccoli, with gold dragons all over it. It was Lissy's old dress that she grew out of. She'd picked it for the dragons especially, but I thought that the dragons should not be on my dress. And I think it was fair that I was the only one who had to wear an old dress to the wedding. My dress is old too, Mom said when I complained. Her dress was green blue silk. That's not the same, I said. Yours doesn't count. Why not, Mom asked laughing. Because you're Mom, I said. There's a picture of Kiki in her dress and the hotel room and Pacey in her dress. Lissy, Mom, Dad, and I went to go sit in the pews while Aunt Linda, Clifford's mother, pinned flowers onto Mom and Dad and rushed Kiki to the back for photographs. The church was full of people. Everyone was talking and laughing so fast that it sounded like hundreds of clicking chopsticks. I could barely hear the organ music playing. Suddenly, without warning, everyone quieted down. Clifford, who looked really funny in his tuxedo, his groomsmen and the priest had walked out and were standing at the altar. The lively organ music changed to slow, booming chords. The wedding was going to begin. First, Clifford's parents came down the aisle, and then Leanne's mother. Then Kiki and the other flower girl, Ting Ting, walked down the aisle. Kiki's mouth made a straight line, and she was clutching her basket so tightly that her knuckles were turning the same color as her dress. But she and Ting Ting made it to the altar without any problem. Of course, if there had been any, any problems, older cousin Hannah and the other bridesmaids in their gleaming gold dresses would have done something because they were walking right behind them. And then the music changed to a stately march and everyone stood up. Here came the bride. Anne was so pretty. Her black hair was braided and curled on her head and her dark eyes sparkled like the diamond ring on her hand. Her long veil covered her and her dress was a waterfall of lace trailing behind her. I didn't know why she was marrying Goofy Clifford. She seemed much too pretty for him. When she got to the altar, Leanne and Clifford faced each other with the priest in between them. They smiled at each other like they had just eaten a warm egg custard on a cold day. And suddenly I realized once Clifford was married, he wouldn't just be our favorite cousin anymore. He'd be a grown-up. He'd be Leanne's husband with a house and a car like Uncle Leo. I sat straight up. Clifford was going to change right in front of me. But then the priest started talking in Taiwanese. He was marrying them in Taiwanese, and I couldn't understand a thing he was saying. I slumped down. This wasn't that much fun. I had to wear an old dress. I didn't get any flowers. No one wanted to take my photo. And I couldn't understand the ceremony. Clifford was changing, and I wasn't part of it. Mom nudged me to sit up. I straightened up again and tried not to be rude. The dark wood of the pew was smooth and warm against my fingers. The light from the stained glass windows cast a glow on the guests, and our shiny silk dresses shimmered. I watched a tear run down Aunt Lydia's cheek, leaving a trail of black from her makeup. She was smiling, though, so I knew they were what people called tears of joy. I always thought that was strange. I never cried when I was happy, but I guess this meant that Aunt, Lindy, Aunt Linda was happy about Clifford changing, so maybe this change wasn't all that bad either. The minister droned on and on. Finally, Leanne was talking, and then Clifford. This was it. It was almost official. And then it was. Clifford kissed Leanne, and everyone stood up and clapped and cheered. Clifford was married. Chapter 21. Clifford's Chinese Reception. After the church ceremony, we drove to a Chinese restaurant called China Pearl. Clifford had rented the whole restaurant for the whole evening. I guess he needed to because there were so many guests. Lissy, Kiki, and I followed Mom to the private room where Leanne was changing. All the women were helping. They clucked around Leanne like chickens waiting to be fed. Hello, Leanne said to us as we came in. I guess I'm your new cousin. Leanne spoke English like mom. You could understand what she was saying, but she did have an accent. She was changing into a shining red Chinese dress. I knew red was the lucky color in China, so I wasn't surprised. It was the color of brilliant ruby. A gold and silver dragon and a bird were embroidered on it. The bird is a phoenix, Leanne said when she saw me staring at her dress. It's a tradition for Chinese weddings because a dragon symbolizes the groom and a phoenix symbolizes the bride. That made me wish even more that my dress didn't have dragons on it. I felt like dragons were for boys. From a leaf green silk covered box, Aunt Linda took out a fancy Chinese hairpin in the shape of a butterfly. The wings looked as if they were made of gold thread, and the green jade stones on them looked like shiny jelly beans. I almost wanted to taste them. Who should fix Leanne's hair? Aunt Linda said. I'll do it, I said. I thought it'd be fun, but and then I could be part of the, the wedding too. But everyone laughed. 
No, Cousin Hannah told me. It has to be a lucky adult woman, someone who has parents, a husband, and kids that are alive, happy, and healthy. It's so the woman's good luck will be passed on to the bride. Aunt Linda said, I think your mom should do it. Mom protested because she was nervous about fixing Leanne's hair. I don't want to make it ugly, she said, but everyone is insisted. Just as mom was putting the fragile butterfly in Leanne's hair, there was a loud knock at the door. Hello, Clifford called out. You better take care of this, Cousin Hannah said to Leanne's mother with a wink. As they left, Leanne and Aunt Linda laughed as if there was a joke. Lissy and I looked at each other puzzled, so we went too, followed by Kiki, Ting Ting, and some other bridesmaid. You know you have to pay up if you want to see your bride, Cousin Hannah said to Clifford. What do you have for us? You're not really going to make me pay, are you, Clifford asked. That old tradition? Come on, let me in. Nope, Cousin Hannah said. We're waiting. At first I was surprised that Hannah was being so mean, but her eyes were twinkling and I could see that everyone was trying hard not to smile and laugh. This must have been the joke. Okay, Clifford said, here's $9.99. $9.99, Cousin Hannah said. Are you crazy? Is that what your bride is worth to you? Hey, it's nine nine nine. Clifford said. I've tripled the lucky number. Why is nine a lucky number, Lissy asked. Because it sounds like the Chinese word for forever, Clifford told us. So $9.99 means forever times three. Cheapskate. Hannah said, I'm ashamed to be related. Okay, okay, Clifford said, $99.99. Well, that's even better, said Hannah. Still, I think Leanne is worth more than $99.99. You know, Clifford said, handing Leanne's mother a red envelope. You're completely right. She is worth much more than $99.99. Here, Hannah took the envelope from Leanne's mother and started counting. 200, 300, 500, 999 dollars and 99 cents. Everyone exclaimed and shouted in appreciation. I didn't see anything because I was so shocked. I didn't know Clifford was so rich. Maybe his grandparents gave him the money. Okay, Hannah said, you can have the bride. Leanne, and out came Leanne. She looked even prettier than she had in the church. She was sparkling red and gold, and in the light, she glittered like tinsel on a Christmas tree. Clifford grinned like a jack-o'-lantern as he saw her. Come on, everyone, Clifford said, as he offered Leanne his arm. Let's go and eat. We'll pick up with the reception tomorrow with Chapter 22, Double Happiness. We've been reading Year of the Rat by Grace Lynn. This book is published by Little Brown and Company. My name is Sarah Mari. I'm one of the librarians at Portland Public Library in Portland, Maine, and I hope you will join me again tomorrow for more of this book. Thanks for listening. Bye.